Um, so my talk is entitled Surrealism, Cultural Astronomy and Astrology, the Esoteric Art of Jules Salah. In Argentinian Spanish, the painter whose name I'm, whose work I'm looking at is uh, pronounced Jules Salah. So uh, my work in particular is always has, uh, or tends to have a modern focus. I'm concerned with how ancient medieval Renaissance ideas ended up in the present and how they are reinterpreted, um, uh, adapted, appropriated, and used. And particularly the ways in which uh, esoteric ideas, ideas about the inner life, the inner world, are understood in the modern West. One phrase I use is uh, this word here, occulture, coined by Christopher Partridge in his book, uh, The Reenchantment of the West. So, um, you could say I'm interested not so much in uh, cultural astronomy, it's occultural astrology, and uh, occultural astronomy. So, in this talk, I'm going to introduce the astronomical, astrological painting of the Argentinian painter Shul Salah. I'm going to consider his work in relation to theories of quality, and then I'm going to consider how various theoretical terms may be applied to archaeo. Astronomy and cultural astronomy. So my framework, that surrealism, Charles Salah's work, as you will see, you will instantly recognize as surreal. Now, um, uh, surreal art comes in two uh, categories, really, with a capital S. There were the surrealists who uh, called themselves surrealists and gathered around the, the poet André Breton in Paris. And then there's surrealism as a general concept. And uh, Solar was not one of the uh, group who gathered around André Breton. He was just a surrealist in the general sense. So surrealism uh, is described here by Celia Rab uh, Rabinovich as semi-religious and here by Emmy Warlick as uh, drawing its inspiration from uh, magical transformational philosophy and an aspiration to discover the truth through inner processes. So there's always an emphasis on the inner, that the, the artist has an inner life and he's communicating with, or she is communicating with, the viewer's inner life. But modernity, we live in the modern world. Uh, it's pretty much compulsory in the humanities and social sciences, at least in the academic context in the United Kingdom to have an understanding of the concepts of modernity and post-modernity because these then become a framework for discussing any kind of cultural phenomena. Is it modern or is it post-modern? This is a, a basic standard framework. So here's uh, Boris Castell and Sergio Sismundo talking about modernity in their book, The Art of Science. They say the modern world and perhaps what it means to be modern is thoroughly entwined with science. And science has different meanings in, in different languages. In the English language, this does mean uh, heavily materialistic and deeply skeptical about the value of the inner world or the existence of consciousness independent of matter and so on. It's heavily materialistic and positivist. Um, but we could look at how such words are applied to modern astrology. This is so then on the sociology of modern astrology. Uh, this is from an article pub, uh, written by Martin Bauer and John Durant, London School of Economics, Social Psychology, Science Museum. Um, so coming from a, a fairly scientific perspective, they, they describe um, astrology as one among a number of potential compensatory activities that may be attractive to individuals who are struggling to come to terms with the uncertainties of life in late modernity. Then there's, they go on and conclude, popular belief in astrology today may be part and parcel of late modernity. So late modernity is a little sub-chronological period that is supposed to be basically a transition from modernity to post-modernity. It's a crisis, supposedly, at which it, uh, the crisis point in which people are losing faith in science and the modern world and technology 
and then struggling, and then they move forward to uh, the world of post-modernity, in which there's great scepticism about science and technology. That this is um, a standard framework. It's a framework which I would question, but it's the framework which is uh, commonly applied by sociologists. So let's look at then surrealism and astrology. This is André Breton then, uh, author of the Surrealist Manifesto. He uh, gave an interview on astrology in 1954. He said, the surrealists generally took a lively interest in astrology, seeing it from a poetic perspective without going very deeply into it. What I've always valued enormously in astrology is not so much the lyrical game to which it lends itself, as the multi-layered logical game, which is a necessary part of it on which it is founded. So I've underlined those two words, lyrical game and logical game, um, to leap forward to my conclusion, I actually suggest that those phrases might be useful ones to apply to instances of the use of astronomy in uh, monumental architecture, for example, with some lyrical game being played. Just up at the top there, very tiny, you'll see the illustration. That's actually a horoscope cast which Andre Breton cast uh, for the surrealist writer Paul Elwan. So this is Shul Salah, my key subject. His full name was Oscar Augusta Alejandro Shul Salah. So his real name was in fact Salari. So he just conveniently shortened it to uh, Solar uh, in order to evoke the sun. And you'll see his uh, name here is Schultz. Uh, and so he sort of converted that into Shul. Shul uh, is L-U-X backwards, L-U-X is light. So he's building a sort of lyrical game into his name. He was born in Buenos Aires on the 14th of December 1887, died in 1963, um, and I've just explained uh, the development of his name here. Um, now, here's a bit of uh, chronology. So in 1912, he uh, set off on a ship to Hong Kong, but he got off the ship in London. Um, he then travelled through Europe, in, in Italy and France, and in uh, London in 1913, 1913, he met an artist called Austin Osman Spare. And Austin Osman Spare is known as the father of English surrealism. And Spare introduced Solar to Alistair Crowley, the famous occultist, often called the infamous occultist and magician. And Solar then uh, came into contact with this magical order, the magical order of the Silver Star. <coughs> And then he adopted his pseudonym in 1917. Then he became active in the Theosophical Society. So, in a sentence, the Theosophical Society uh, believed uh, that ancient esoteric wisdom should be revived in order to prepare people for the transition to the coming spiritual new age, often called the Age of Aquarius. Um, and there were magical spin offs from this. Uh, as such, has been lost to Sol. So, uh, Sola uh, began to paint. He exhibited in Milan in 1920, and then he did actually uh, exhibit in uh, Paris in 1934, which was the same year that Breton published the Surrealist Manifesto. I've tried to find out whether Sola met Breton. I'm uh, told that probably he didn't, because Breton by then was almost the, you know, the, the leader of a close group and basically to get an audience with him was pretty difficult. Um, so Solar did join the Surrealist Circle, but he was initiated into the Order of the Silver Star by Crowley in 1924. So that's his, and then he went back to Argentina and stayed there or in Uruguay for the rest of his life. Now I encountered Solar in 2011 in uh, Buenos Aires. I'd never heard of him. Um, I uh, went along to his museum, uh, which is here in Buenos Aires, and there were parties of uh, primary school children going around, sitting on the floor, drawing pictures of Sean Salah paintings and so on. Salah is a major, major iconic figure in Argentina. 
In fact, so much so that I was told that younger, the younger generation now are turning against him because, as generations do, they reject the iconic figures of their elders. But in 2013, there was a major exhibition devoted to him at a Buenos Aires airport, which I didn't see. It was called the Art of Friendship. And what I was told was, was as, as you went up the escalators <coughs> to the International Departure Lounge, you passed this huge sign saying the Art of Friendship, and there was this, this huge uh, uh, exhibition, uh, reproduction <coughs> of the last one. So he's a major figure in Argentina, and almost unknown outside of the Spanish-speaking world. Uh, he was well, such a major figure that his major advocate was the uh, writer Borges, famous for his association with the term magical realism. Some people argue about that. Some people say Borges didn't, wasn't the first magical realist or magical realist at all. But he is commonly associated with this term uh, magic realism, in which depictions of the natural world are in fact very unnatural. So. Borges wrote, when we speak of a man of another time, Shaw is already one of them. I believe that we will carry on living, our children will carry on living, our grandchildren will carry on living. I don't know if they will understand that extraordinary man, Shaw. Um, now, this is one of Salah's uh, paintings. It's a huge painting called um, Zodiac. Okay, so we have it begins with Gemini here, and then moves left to Taurus, uh, Aries, Pisces, Aquarius, uh, and on right through uh, to Leo and Virgo. And you'll see that these are all very idiosyncratic. These are not uh, really recognisable zodiacal images from anything known in the Western tradition. They're completely idiosyncratic. Um, and they were worked out in previous notebooks. So this is one of his notebooks where he's beginning to work out the figures of this painting. Um, this is a quote from Walter L. Adam, uh, Adamson, Modernism and Art. He said, both avant-gardism and modernism responded to the increasing modification of Western culture the, uh, the one by somehow decorrupting or extracting the otherness out of the commodified object from art, the other by feeding the commodified object altogether in Festivata's pure form. So pure form is uh, what Adam Adamson identifies as the goal. And so my uh, interpretation of what Solar is doing is trying to reconstruct the pure form. He's finding the existence the existing representations of the zodiac, uh, zodiacal forms, which go back, you know, right back to the early medieval period, are deeply rooted in classical Greek mythology. He finds them inadequate. He's completely reinvented them. This is a, another one, Planetas de Regente, uh, Planetary Rulers, 1955. You can see how angular these are these so these are the planets the planetary rulers of the zodiacal signs. So you know, you know, the the, the idea of planets ruling uh, zodiacal signs so again deeply rooted in classical astronomy. So Solar and the tradition. Okay, here's Mars. There's Mars looking clearly very angry. So on one hand, tradition. He's clearly drawing on tradition. This is a standard interpretation of Mars from a major English textbook on astrology from the 17th century, which I've just used uh, because it's representative. Okay, it's representative of a standard tradition. Uh, Mars is a lover of slaughter, quarrels, murder, thievery, in general has a ruddy, so red complexion, a rule swords and knives, and delight in red colour or yellow, fiery and shining like sapphire. So I always use yellow and red here, quite deliberately. There's a little bit of blue creeping in there. Yellow and red, and there's an angry face, a pointy face. Is this a knife uh, Mars is holding? Head is pointed like a sharp, you know, like a sharp implement. So clearly, there is a representation of tradition here. Um, Paul Helas, 
who was one of the first major scholars to write on modern New Age ideas, uh, developed this concept of detraditionalization. So he said, actually, what New Age thought often does, what New Age ideas do, is appeal to the past very uh, ostentatiously to say these ideas are ancient. They come from ancient Egypt or ancient Atlantis or somewhere. But at the same time, they are often of a very recent derivation. So he says they are detraditionalized. The tradition is forgotten. Something else is made up which, which appeals to the tradition. So I just thought here I would use one of the images that Diana Cheney showed yesterday from Edward Byrne Jones, The Planet 1879. Far more recognizable as a um, part of the mainstream uh, representation of the diacal signs in uh, Western imagery. A heroic figure. And here, so I dumped the heroic figure, almost gone back to first base with the red, the yellow, the anger, and has created something new. So it's the tradition ones. And of course, Solar, who's a follower of Crowley, he's mixed with a philosophist. We could call him actually a classic New Age figure in terms of his context. Um, now, in terms of the wider environment, what's astronomy in the built environment? You know, archaeological astronomy deals heavily with the built environment. Modern architecture. Now, this is a building from 2013 um, in Copenhagen. So, you know, removed in time and place from this image of Mars. But, you know, if we think about how astronomy is represented in buildings, apart from symbolism, alignments, and, uh, and so on, then in a sense, there's a parallel here. So, I'm not, I'm not saying this is directly related to, to this directly. I'm saying there are comparisons. There's a cultural comparison between a modern building here and a modern piece of cultural astronomical or, or occultural cultural astronomical uh, imagery there. Um, he also designed a chessboard with uh, zodiacal images on it. His Pisces, um, it's called Universal Chess around 1945, and this just reminded me of Breton's view of astrology as a multi-layered logical game. Masks and personas. This is the uh, an image of the sun uh, solar from his encounter with Theosophy in London. Would have been very aware of one of the key theosophical astronomical tenets, which is a, a revival of the Hermetic idea from the fourth Semeticum, uh, from Hellenistic Egypt, that the the physical sun we see is the <coughs> The, the, the outer manifestation of an inner sun, the inner logos, which is the spiritual soul of the universe. So, uh, solar, here's solar's image of the sun. I haven't found a place where he referenced this to uh, that theosophical view of the sun, but there's a, uh, there's a comparison which I am making. Uh, just uh, actually out of interest, um, <coughs> Solar also did uh, cast Borges' horoscope. Now, just think, this is just of interest because here's these two iconic Argentinian figures, and here we are penetrating actually their inner life, their deeper philosophy. Um, essentialism. So we saw Adamson Adamson Adam, Adam talked about becoming, you know, achieving the pure form. Um, Here's uh, Solar's picture of Christ uh, being interpreted here by Aldo Pellegrini as, as an attempt to portray the pure man, or the pure inner man, the pure inner man that we can all um, become, with direct reference to Catholic theology. So was Solar a surrealist? This is, uh, he wasn't a part of the surrealist club. This is Alexandrian on surrealist art, saying, a revolution magic are the two values which surrealism can feel its unconfessed raison d'etre, which was to make religion out of her of inspiration. So let's say with Solar, we have these images of the planets, images of the zodiac, but he's making a religion out of her inspiration. Let's use those words in terms of what he's doing. Modernism, here is uh, Wells Radinson again on modernism. Just, we are talking about cultural renewal, the cultural renewal of, of, of Europe. This is what the modernists were trying to do. And then he talks here about things other terms such as space time compression associated with new development technologies, communication, and transportation. 
that's the wider context of um, modernism. So in other words, people travel fast on planes, they travel fast on cars, they travel fast on trains. Conventional view of outer modernity, solar inner person. Um, Charles Jenks uh, looked at three kinds of modern modernization, the condition of modernity and cost of modernity. So he says that one, one definition of modernity will not do. He's saying we need three. You can have cultural modernism in which I'm saying we can get people like Solar who are um, dealing with the inner world and there's no competition between that and the outer modernism of trains, planes, computers and so on. And Stephen Best and Douglas Kellner in their book Postmodern Theory talk about aesthetic modernity. So, you know, Solar can be an, uh, um, a representative of aesthetic modernity. So, to conclude then, um, I think that if we look at someone like Solar, basically uh, we have to accept him as modern. This challenges uh, narrative conceptions of what modernity is, and we can then open up more nuanced discussions of what it is. And if we look at his work as a cultural or occultural astronomer, what ideas can we take from it and descriptions of it to apply them to um, archaeoastronomy and cultural astronomy in general, for example, the attempt to create a pure form or play a lyrical game through developing a kind of aesthetic modernity. Thank you.